Welcome to the Copper Spice YouTube channel, and thanks for joining us. In this video, we are going to do another series of small C++ topics, which all have a common theme. C++ Tapas. There is an interesting connection between these topics. Type name is used to make the intent clear to the compiler. Virtual and override are used mostly to make the intent of the code clear to the reader of the source code. There are good reasons to use virtual and peer virtual methods, and there are trade-offs for doing so. As we start to look at type name and where it is used, we want to also establish a few other terms and define what they mean in C++. A template type parameter is a single parameter located between the greater than and less than symbols, preceded by the word template. Regardless of how many template type parameters are declared, the group of parameters is called a template parameter list. In contrast, the list of data types and identifiers for a method or function is simply called a parameter list. In the example shown here, the word type name precedes the identifier in the template type parameter. So what does type name mean? It is a keyword which is required in some specific places in template programming. In this example, type name is used to indicate the template type parameter identifier is a data type rather than a non-type template parameter. In a template type parameter, using the keyword type name has the same meaning as the older keyword class. It is worth noting that type name cannot be used randomly, and it will cause a compiler error if it is not required. Understanding when it is required and when it is not allowed causes some frustration until you know why. So what is a non-type template parameter? It is simply a value passed to a template. Unlike passing a value to an ordinary function, passing a value in a template instantiation occurs at compile time. This means there are only a few specific data types which are allowed for non-type template parameters. All of the integral data types, such as int and long, are permitted. You can also use any enumeration data type, since they are based on an underlying integer data type. You may also declare a non-type template parameter to receive an L-value reference, as well as several kinds of pointers. Keep in mind that since template instantiation occurs at compile time, the value passed must be a compile time constant. For example, you can pass the address of a global, but you cannot pass the address of a local since it's not known at compile time. There is another kind of template parameter, which is not used very often. A template template parameter is closely related to a normal template type parameter. Here we have an example of a templated function, which takes a map of key value pairs and returns a new map with the keys and values swapped. Using a template template parameter enables the instantiated template to decipher the identifier box based on the data type of the past container, which is old map. If the reverse map function used a normal template type parameter to receive the map data, it would have no way of determining the key and value type without some external mechanism like a type trait. By using a template template parameter, you can extract the first and second template arguments directly. Then you can return a new container using the same kind of container, which in this example is a map. Type name is also used to inform the compiler that a dependent name is in fact a data type. Compiling a template happens in two parts or phases. In phase one, the compiler needs to know which identifiers are data types. C++ cannot be parsed accurately without knowing which names are meant to be data types. If the identifier is not a data type, it could be something like a member variable or an enum or even a method. It is pretty obvious when reading this code 
that T is meant to be a data type, since it is a template type parameter. But what about the name STD vector T colon colon iterator, which is shown in light blue? This is a dependent name, but is it a data type? In phase one of compiling, the compiler knows T is a data type, but not which specific data type. This means that in phase one, the compiler cannot determine if the name is actually a data type. In other words, is the dependent name a dependent type, or is the dependent name referring to a member variable? By requiring the keyword type name, we are promising to the compiler this name will always be a data type. If you ever instantiate this template with a T that causes this name to not be a data type, you will get a compiler error in phase two. These two examples show a using statement and a type trait, which both contain a dependent name. The keyword type name is required so the compiler knows the dependent name is actually a data type. Not every use of a type trait in template code will require the keyword type name. In the second example, if you replace the T with a specific data type, then this type trait would not be a dependent name, and it would be a compiler error if you kept the keyword type name. The container, STD vector, is not what determines if this is a dependent name. It is the T. Another place where type name is needed is in the out-of-line definition of a method located in a templated class. In this example, size type is a type alias, which is declared inside the body of the class. The return type of the count method is the alias size type. In the implementation of the count method, the return data type is a dependent type since it depends on the widget T. The next topic we want to discuss is the concept of a virtual method. Virtual methods are declared in a base class using the virtual keyword. Depending upon your design, the base class method may or may not have an implementation. A virtual method in a base class may be overridden in classes which inherit from that base class. Not every derived class needs to implement the virtual methods it inherited from the parent. When using virtual methods, you really should take advantage of the override keyword, which was added in C++11. Doing so will give you a compile error if the method in the derived class does not exactly match the signature of the virtual method in the base class. Prior to C++11, there was no way for the compiler to diagnose this issue, and the effect could be that the derived class implementation was silently ignored. The purpose of a virtual method is to ensure the derived class method is called even if the calling code uses a pointer whose data type is pointer to the base class. If the base class method is not marked virtual, you cannot override it in a derived class. You can always declare a method with the same name and the same parameters in a derived class, but this will simply shadow the base class method rather than overwriting it. As a simple example, consider a base class named fruit, which defines a virtual pie-worthy method. In the base class, we define pie-worthy to return true with the assumption that most fruit will make a delicious pie. When we implement the class orange, we override the pie-worthy method to return false, since the idea of a pie made from oranges sounds rather messy. In these examples, we are looking at when and under what circumstances the base class method pie-worthy is called versus the method in the derived class. In the first example, we have a fruit object. In the second example, we have an orange object. And in the third example, we have a fruit pointer that points to an orange. In the first case, since object is a fruit, the method in fruit is called. In example two, since object is an orange, the method of pie worthy in class orange is called. 
In example three, although the object has the data type pointer to fruit, it actually points to an orange. Since PyWorthy was declared with virtual, the method in class orange will be called. If PyWorthy had not been declared virtual in the fruit class, then example three would call the method in fruit, even though object points to an instance of orange. The concept of virtual provides runtime polymorphism. This concept is the ability to select the appropriate method based on the data type of an object. The fundamental difference is that normal method calls are early bound in C++. The compiler will determine at compile time, based on the data type of the object or pointer involved, which version of a method to call. When the virtual keyword is added, the compiler switches to late binding, which means to wait until runtime, then dispatch to the appropriate method based on the runtime data type of the object. Pure virtual is an extension to the virtual concept. Often there is no default implementation in the base class, because only the derived classes have enough information to properly implement the method. In these cases, you should declare the base class method as pure virtual by assigning the value 0 to the method declaration. This makes the base class an abstract class, since any class which has one or more pure virtual methods is considered abstract. An abstract class cannot be instantiated. In order to instantiate an abstract class, you will need to inherit from the base class and provide implementations for all the pure virtual methods. To illustrate the idea of a pure virtual method, let's look at another example. In the fruit class, the isPeelConsumable method is declared as pure virtual, which means class fruit is an abstract class. In class apple, an override of isPeelConsumable is provided with an implementation. In this example, apple is not an abstract class. So how does this work in practice? Looking at these three examples, which version of isPeelConsumable is called? The first example has a fruit object. The second example uses an apple object. And the third example has a fruit pointer which points to an apple. In the first example, we are declaring an object of type fruit. This code does not actually compile. Class fruit has a pure virtual method, so it is considered an abstract class. This means you are not allowed to create an actual object of type fruit. In the second example, object has a data type of apple. And in the third example, we are storing an apple object in a pointer of type fruit. It does not matter if we are storing an apple object by value or pointing to an apple. In both cases, the compiler will call the version of isPeelConsumable in apple, since that dynamic type of object has a data type of apple, and the method is late bound. In the last two examples, deciphering which version of isPeelConsumable to call is done at runtime, because the method call is late bound. In reality, most compilers should be able to figure out which method to call at compile time, and your code will not pay the price of a late bound method call. As your code becomes more complex, the ability of the compiler to de-virtualize this method call becomes more difficult. Using virtual methods, which result in late bound method dispatch, has some runtime cost. This is something worth paying attention to when designing your application or library. For more information about the Copper Spice project, please visit our website at www.copperspice.com. Thanks for watching. We hope you found the content of value. If you have any questions or feedback, feel free to leave a comment on this video or send us an email. Please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and come back in two weeks for our next video.